So it's 5.30 and maybe there are uh, another people coming in, but um, I think we start at the moment. So welcome to the breakout session with our two panelists, Gitta Pine and Peter Matisse. Great to have you here and warm welcome Gitta, warm welcome Peter. Thank you. My Thanks. name is Christine and I'm the facilitator of this session. For me, this one is very special because I've been working closely with all, both organizations, Conscious Business Institute with Peter Matisse for over six years and with Gitas Baumwelten Institute for two, almost two years now. It's great that here at Lanaka Conferences is the opportunity to connect my two hard projects. We could already hear in the panel statement what drives both of them. And here we have the opportunity to deepen that and hopefully derive very concrete action to work on. So as Petra Kümpel in her keynote said, um, there are so many steps already taken and now it's time to put the pieces of the puzzle together. Before we start, um, some organizational stuff. This session will be recorded and published afterwards. And we have about 40 minutes um, per breakout session mm -hmm that there's enough place for um, to visit another one as well. So now it's up to you. It's your arena. I hope for a dynamic and powerful dialogue. I know both of my panelists love that. <laughs> and a fruitful time together and maybe interesting conflict lines. Somebody wants to start? Sure, I'll start. Um, hi. hi. Um, my name is Axel Zimmer. I work in Paris. I'm an associate in a consulting company called Fabric, and we do organizational development around self-organized teams, purpose-based organizations, this sort of thing that you might be familiar with, Sociocracy 3.0, and this type of approach and, and uh, with large companies. And I was really intrigued by this notion of creating the operating system that people want to belong to. And... Um, I, I, I wanted to f first before before yeah I, I'd be curious to hear what what are the characteristics of this operating system that people want to belong to that in your experiences you are also a consulting company doing this with you know a few institutions I I, I don't think I'd heard of you before so I checked out your website at the same time a little while ago so I have a very very superficial understanding of what you do um, but I was curious just to understand what the if you had any takeaways, uh, what are those takeaways on creating the operating system that people want to belong to? Um, that would be my, my question as a starter. Cool. Thanks. Thanks, Axel. Uh, I'm not going to go right into this yet. I think it's good if we hear a few more questions, but it's noted. Thanks. Okay. I would like to Manfred and Ulrike and Intern now go see see who's in the room first so we get to know each other a little and what made you come here. Okay, do you want to address directly, Peter? Uh, with the operating system or no, uh, I I just uh, I just understood you wanted to uh, to check in. Yeah, I, I would love to hear from the others what brought you here, what you would like to get out of this, and maybe just introduce yourselves briefly so we can connect a little bit. Ulrike, I see yeah. you unmuted. Do you want to start? <laughs> I can start. Uh, st second start. <laughs> I, um, I live in Berlin. I work as a facilitator and um, a company transitions and changes as well. I know both Gitta and Christine and indirectly your work, Peter, as well. And um, <laughs> I, uh, well, I, I try my best to, to, to live a, <laughs> I don't know, a, a decent life to, to, to try to do uh, or, or, or live appropriately to what should be done. But I feel myself it's not always easy and I'm lazy myself and all that. So, so this is uh, for myself, both and my clients. I wonder, I, I'm here to see what, what can help all of us in the end and what we discuss here. And um, 
your one you introduced peter the question was how can we uplift our consciousness on a systemic level in a company of for example 100,000 people and i think it's even difficult for yourself as a as a one person <laughs> so this is already one question what what helps you for example um of gita i think i know a little bit more but um i I was also wondering, I understand your heart's, heart's fear, heart's for um, criticism, but I would love to hear of what you would think of how it could be, how, how it would be doable and manageable to, um, apart maybe um, uh, from, uh, what is it, bedingungsloses Grundeinkommen. Mm -hmm. So have you got different ideas? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So, Manfred. who's next? Manfred Schröder, would you I'm like to? Manfred, I'm located uh, in Kiel. I, I've already started this in Germany and. Uh, I'm interested in complexity, but I have to admit that I'm overwhelmed by it sometimes. So uh, in former times, I studied chemistry. I've got a background in natural science. And uh, I often went to Italy to a metaphorum and uh, learned all about constructivism and uh, the way psychologists and socialists uh, think and um, I have been struggling a lot to bring these two worlds of thinking together but uh, um, that's not easy anyways. So um, after after studying I uh, became a consultant and I worked uh, to, to introduce uh, controlling systems uh, in uh, companies of different branches. So I'm I have got a certain kind of economy at, at the company level, not necessarily on the uh, national economic level. Uh, and I'm wondering why the economy is often made uh, the scapegoat of the system that has got its own principles and rules and uh, Uh, as we learned, profit is part of it. So I wonder if it's the right approach uh, to uh, negate profit making. In my opinion, um, I would uh, use the political system as a correction uh, afterwards. Uh, uh, for example, in Denmark the, or even in the USA, there were the times when the income uh, Taxes uh, were about 90%. So instead of making, uh, uh, trying to change the economic system and its rules and uh, the way of thinking, uh, I would uh, uh, use the political system to correct uh, the imbalances created by the economic system. Thank you very Thank much. You. So, Imke, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you, Christine. Um, yes, I'm Imke. Um, I live in Hamburg and I'm working as a consultant and as an agile consultant. Um, and um, I'm just here for listening. Um, but um, in general, I'm pretty much concerned about um, how companies, and especially as a, as a consultant, um, I usually feel this um, in my daily life um, that um, businesses um, um, and also business leaders um, that they sometimes do not um, react um, on, on on changes and and also not they do not sometimes they do not um, feel the impact um, of their work um, in regards to um, climate crisis or in general other crises um, and this is what I, what concerns me um, as a person, but also as a as a consultant. And sometimes I, I really do not know um, what we can do um, as an, as individuals, but also as um, 
as as people in companies um what how we can or what can we do um to to change mindsets to change the way um people think um i um just read a book about um that we need to change the way we think in regards to growth um and that everything um in our economical world in our business world is um about growing about um increasing um for example um the dax um I do not know what this um is in in english um and um also the the gdp everything is about more and more um and this really um makes me concerned because i think there is not more and more um because we live in, on a planet um with limited resources um and i think this does not work um anymore um and this is what really i'm concerned about how can we change um people mindsets how we can change business leaders um and their mindsets i know um that we do not want to um work um on the people we want to work the system or we want to work um and change structures but how um and this is really what what i this is why i'm here um to get some some answers to this question <laughs> Yes. Very important topics. Thank you very much, Imke. So I don't know if I uh, pronounce the name on the right way, Nahu Iguti. <laughs> Welcome in this panel, in this session. Hello. <laughs> My name is Nahu. Nahu. Yeah. <laughs> Now I know. <laughs> um, so I am logging in from Berlin, Germany, but originally from Japan. And I am joining this conference uh, thanks to my friend Jürgen, the, one of the organizers. And um, I, yeah, after listening to your panel discussion, I, yeah, I was intrigued by Peter's question about this. You know, how can we systemically, how can we make a systemic shift? And I am an ecological artist, and. So I, I'm trying to make it very short. Um, um, the art theme that I have been working on is human animal as opposed to human being. So human being to me is the anthropocentric. Um, yeah, like us. <laughs> Majority of us who tend to forget about the rest of the beings in the ecosystem, but human human animals humbly know that they are inter intertwined with the rest of the, the other than human beings and they you know each living being has a role to uh contribute to this regenerative ecosystem and we forgot what it is so my journey as an ecological artist is what it is what is the role of human animal and this question has led me to African savanna, and I put myself exposed to other beings, especially huge mammals, who we tend to, you know, explicitly kick out of our territories, which partially it's good because we don't have to share, uh, you know, the same territories with the many species, but we need to, sh you know, we need to generate not a sense of sharing the same habitats and land including uh, you know the ocean but as we spoke about this growth and expansion we forgot to we forgot and capacity to give more space to other beings as well as other people amongst our society to we take up mental space from other people such as racism or um yeah many things like ecological justice etc so right now as as my artwork i am developing urban design method in order to as a human animal give back more space return the habitats to other than human beings in urban settings so i am developing this tangible methodologies and um i am now working with developers and There are people who like to 
change their properties or the way of living in a more regenerative way. And when I work with organizations, I cannot help but um, face this organizational shift. Um, yeah. Um, I don't yeah. want to interrupt you, but we have uh, not so much time. And, uh, Sorry. I yeah. think it's so interesting <laughs> that we could fill in a whole day with that. But um, I hope it's okay. I give the yeah, word yeah, to... Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> yes. Um, so, um, Julian, do you hear us? And, uh, do you yes, want to... hello, hello, hello. Hello, Julia. welcome. Yeah. Yeah. I'm using an, a strange laptop and uh, I didn't seem to... Uh, work the webcam not home so uh, I, at least you can hear me yeah great. right all right great to have you here hello hello everybody um <clears throat> as my subject i um, I, I really don't think i could uh, be more uh, subjective on economics but uh, the way it seems to me that um, we should use an objective uh, approach of the subject and would be more beneficial for the conversation. So I, I, I used to use Jack Fresco's uh, words and skip the sunny day in May. So <clears throat> when it comes to economics, politics, and uh, other macro level aspects, I really think that we tend to, um, to look too high enough. But instead, we should look and we should analyze it from a micro point of view, because I think that is a um, misdirection used for us, uh, which is why uh, a lot of people uh, have uh, a lot of money and they make, again, a lot of money. And uh, there are people with less money and tend to be and remain poor or even without putting any bread on the table. So as a micro micro aspect, I will um, emphasize on how the environment changes uh, our behavior. And we should start from there. And maybe uh, we could make steps from the lower part of, um, uh, of a systematic working, um, thus growing up in the same system, uh, receiving the same uh, education and seeing the same uh, social uh, objects. I don't think they take us too far as an evolution part of, uh, of you. And I think we do not put our finger uh, in the correct way on important things, but we, um, we always take something for the pain. Like we take a pill, a social pill, but we do not realize where the main problems came from. So I, I don't think there is a, a thing that we should focus on, but we should focus on the way we perceive our society, how we should better our um, behavior, and we should learn uh, uh, more about uh, each other, not uh, more about us. We should learn more about uh, the people around us. So we should understand them better and maybe they will understand us better and we should start for a common, uh, common ground. Thank you very much, Julian. So, Dominic, we already had your in introduction in the, um, in the stream, but um, I think you have uh, one special question brought with, with you. Yeah, uh, so just, just for reference. So, <clears throat> I'm, I'm searching for alternative ways of thinking and acting, and that's why I'm focusing so much to try and offer what I call epistemic learning experiences. So, which should also address uh, both companies and adults and, and kids at the same time. So, a part of that or parts of that are systemic thinking, scientific thinking, and now oh, I'm glad we have a Japanese guest here, So, uh, which is called Monosukuri, the art, science of uh, and craft of making things. So, but I'm also a parent and I have a little daughter of seven years old and um, the usual way we have uh, what's called 
shape the environment for, for our kids is that we lay out a plan, you know, at least where I was born in my generation. So go to school, take this and that education so you can do this and that in the end. So the plan was somehow laid out, you know, and uh, the environment forced forced us more or less to go that very linear direction. But now we are in this situation where we become more conscious about that, wow, we need to change. So my question would be that how should parents or how can parents, better said, address this at home and shape an environment where um, the curiosity of our kids can flourish and uh, where we don't indoctrinate our kids in, in a very narrow and linear way? That's it. Thank you very much, Dominic. So um, I think I uh, invite Kita first. There are so many th thoughts um, coming can, coming up. Do you want to? Yes, I can do that. Thank thoughts? you very much. Thank you very much. I will start with the question where Rike uh, uh, throw in. Uh, how could something like hard sphere um, look like? without all the oppression coming with it, right? That was your question. Um, it's simple. Um, on one hand, we actually need systems like Monosopoli in uh, economy everywhere. It's called Lean in Germany and the United States. But uh, with Lean came some changes that uh, partly um, contradict the original thoughts. So it's, in my opinion, important to study Monosopoli in order to comprehend what can be done to uh, respectfully work with colleagues and to create um, worthy products. That's one part. The other is, of course, unconditional basic income. Um, but we do not have to do this um, completely from the, from the start. We can do it um, step by step by starting with those who actually already are contributing to society with their work, but earning no money for it, like charity workers, mothers, fathers, yeah, who are working at home, people who are caring for their uh, elderly, etc. There we can start. And we can start with those who um, work um, as researchers, but earn no money, artists who contribute to society, I would start there. That is a simple way and it is affordable. Um, and we have to uh, keep in mind that we are living in digitization, which actually means every single piece of work that can be linear, linearized will be in the end done by AI and robotics. So we have to do this. The other question came from, or it was, a, it was more a remark than a question, complexity from uh, Manfred Schröder. Thank you very much. Um, yes, complexity sometimes is overwhelming. I have created a model to help people, societies, uh, societies, teams, organizations to work better with complexity, which uh, works with three attribute, attributes. How many dimensions can you put on a complex problem? How differentiated can you address the problem? And how fast you can you do this? There is an article existing, and if Christine would be so kind and can put the link into the chat here, mm -hmm. you can read it, work with it, and there are also workshops on it. But I think the article will help a lot, because then you can step back and think about the problem you are facing and can think about, okay, how many dimensions can I see here? How differentiated can I see it? And how fast can I think my way through it? That was that. And the other question you asked, Manfred, political or business? The problem with politics is public politics comes from urbanization. And uh, it was constructed uh, the way politics we, we know now in democratic uh, uh, states um, is co was constructed for cities and states with no more than 200,000 people. Today, we have a far bigger complexity to work with, which in the end means that pol politics is always too slow to work with the problems uh, they are trying to address. But there's this but. Politics, we have to press on politics because we need politics to work with us to um, create clear boundaries for um, sharks, to create clear boundaries for those who are living from the system without giving anything back. 
Now, in Germany, we have, for example, the problem with tempo limit. We need this because it's contrib it contributes to uh, CO2 reduction, and we do not get it because of politics is dealing with politics. And we, working in business, we have to put the pressure point here, and not only um, when we want their support to create new cars. Imke, you were concerned about climate crisis, why business do not react. Uh, and then I noted we cannot, ah, this, this I was, um, we have to understand business systemically. Um, the first um, thing about business we have to know is the language of business is and stays money. And as long as this is the case, every single action we take that is addressing a social problem or a politic, political problem or whatever is in the end not understood by the business organization. The only way we can do this is by addressing the people. And when we address the people, we still have to keep in mind that we do, when we do that, business still has to survive. And that is one of the many problems here we have to deal with. Um, it, it will be a slow process. And what Peter is doing and what we are doing from the Von Welten Institute is helping people to get come to a higher clarity, mm -hmm. to a higher complexity level awareness, to higher complexity management skills. So in the end, they can better comprehend that what they are doing will finally kill them <laughs> if they do not change. And the other thing you, you ask, how can we change mindsets or how can we change ourselves or the systems? The thing is, what we do not understand, we can only change by trial and error. So first we have to understand how human cognition is working, how human communication is working. And when we know that, and we are already there, system theory has given us many uh, um, um, models to reconstruct human cognition and communication, and we are finally capable to artificially emulate this, them. And then we can see which cognitive cognitive way, which forms of cognition, which forms which forms of communication are finally functional and which are not. And there we have to look at the context. So we are getting there. Yeah, but it is we are we have entered a new era, and with this new era come new uh, opportunities, but also of course new problems. And now we have to work our way up to complete new sets of uh, concepts. This is that. Now, um, how can we make an economical shift? And the answer is very simple: together. Um, Inke. Um, how the yes no no if that was Julian you you said something really important from my perspective how the, the, how the environment uh, makes the behavior uh, that is is to me key factor to almost everything we have to look at the context when we go uh, um, when we work with people from a solely psychological perspective we have to understand that modern psychology mostly gets their data from the from the middle class. And that is a problem when we think about the problems in uh, in uh, 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 slums, the problems poor people have, the way they think, the way they are traumatized, the way they act in their environments. So that is something we have to address here too. So we have to add to psychological models, social uh, sociological models, in order to get a broader perspective on what is going on there. If we do not do that, we are only addressing leadership and middle class and no one else. And only and through leadership and middle class, we cannot change the world in, in, in the whole because uh, we are missing a, a, a big part of, of the human, human community. So I think I have everything. Dominic, how can parents address the problems at home? Um, there is um, one thing the Dalai Lama once said, I love very much. Teach them respect for insects. Thank you very much, Gita, for your energetic, dynamic answer. So we, we, are just, we have our moment. We don't have so much time, so I rush through everything. Yeah, I'm really glad that we have a um, uh, that uh, that we record this session because uh, otherwise I would not be able to make any documentation of that. <laughs> Thank you very much. This was very dense and um, very much content in it. So, Peter, now it's your turn. 
Well, um, I'm not sure whether I can provide some many answers, but I want to actually start with a little quote that just came past me yesterday, which is the arc of the universe, the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice, Martin Luther King. And maybe we can adopt that. The arc of the human evolution is long, but it bends towards uh, consciousness, increasing consciousness. So um, when I look at what's happening in the world, I mean, you, you group you're right here, we don't need to speak to you about transformation because you are transformation. If I look at the younger generation, they come into the world with a completely different mindset. So uh, it's not necessary to speak to them about transformation because they are transformation, basically. Um, so I think when we speak about these things, we need to trust that we are part of a bigger um, evolutionary shift that's happening. And we are just the stewards that to usher this along. We might perish along the way. That's an option. Um, hope, hopefully we can get the corner. But um, I think that's something we need to bear in mind. Because if we don't, then we go out and try to change people. And that's never worked out properly. So maybe one, the first takeaway is if we go into organizations or if you ask how can you change leaders, it's not about changing them. If you come with a mindset, something needs changing, uh, you will create resistance. Um, so what's the alternative? The alternative that I've worked found find, uh, work well is to create a possibility. Yeah, we can either change by pain or by pleasure. By pain is we try to move them. I'm not sure whether this is going to work. Uh, or by creating something where they say, wow, I would love to explore that. So uh, can we speak to them in a way that they see this shift as an enormous opportunity for themselves, for their own well-being, for their families, uh, for the environment and for their organizations. So that's a shift that we need to come with. Um, secondly, you've, you've spoken, um, I think actually you were that, um, spoken about the operating system. I'm just gonna put a little link into the chat here, which shows a little video of um, the operating system that we've created. Uh, this operating system that we use, I'm just going to show one slide picture and you can look at the video later, is basically came to me in a meditation about, about 12 years ago. We've been using it in organizations and it strongly resonates with the people that we talk to. Um, I'm just going to bring it up real quick, if that's okay with you guys. Basically, the question, can you see this? Yep. Yes. Yeah, the question that we've been asking is what differentiates an inspiring company from an ordinary one? And we've uh, received these four quadrants here, which means if, if you can show up fully being yourself, fully express yourself, which is a human need that we all have, if you can connect to others genuinely, which is a human need that we have, if you can make a difference, another human need, and then if you can create money along the way. If these four are fulfilled, then there's really no reason people want to leave the organization. If you look at these four quadrants, it's basically everything you do. If you have a relationship with somebody, you want to be yourself, you want to connect, you want to create something together, have a common purpose, and you want to be sustained. So what we found is that if we focus on helping organizations build these four quadrants, the organization transforms. And it also becomes more profitable, and it also becomes more life-giving, and it also creates more belonging for people. Yeah. We have our programs to do that, but you, you probably have your own approaches where you can go in or you can talk to us further how to how to best do that. And lastly, we've been talking about conscious leadership uh, with Jan and, and Regina earlier. What's the leadership principle that can create that and also maintain that if if the if if things go wrong? The problem that we see is that most business focus on this. But if, if they focus on leadership development, they focus on team building, but when shit hits the fan, pardon my French here, which happens all the time, we go back to the lower right quadrant and it becomes all about margins and profits again. Am I the only one who's only seen half of the uh, circle? Um, not only half, maybe four, four yeah. from five. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Maybe you can uh, reduce the image a little. There we go. Let's see. Try this. Does this work? Yes, yeah, perfect. Yeah. 
So you can look at that uh, in the video. It's explained there. It's about six minutes video. This is the reason why companies fail. This is the reason what we as individuals do on a daily basis. We revert back to safety, to security, making money, operating from fear. This is basically the, the, the lower right quadrant. It's about security on an individual level. It's about money and margins in the business. Um, and that destroys everything that we want to build because the trust in the leader is getting eroded. So the big question that we ask, which you can ask your, your, um, your clients as well, is how can we shift from focusing on this bottom right quadrant to balancing this entire circle so that people can show up, so that they want to be connected, so that we have a common purpose. And suddenly you speak about topics that are life-giving for people, even for the leaders. So when we work with organizations, they said, if we can build a company like that, that would be absolutely awesome. Yeah, so we can discuss this. You can consider this approach you know, for yourself, for your family, for <laughs> and maybe even for the companies that we work with. Um, are there any questions? Let me stop here before I go into anything else. Any thoughts, questions about what is house? I have one. Mm -hmm. How do you ensure that this does not ideologize? When you create companies where you put values um, um, very, um, very high up, uh, like you have um, outlined here, how do you ensure that uh, this company does not um, become like IBM every morning sing their IBM song? Um, that's, a, that's a very good question. We've actually never seen that um, mm -hmm. because we connect to the deeper human needs that want to be expressed, self-expression, mm -hmm. connection, mm -hmm. having a purpose. And if we can encourage people to find out how they best want to do that on a day-to-day -day level, then that's, that's life-giving. Mm -hmm. Um, if it's being abused and say, we now have to sing the company song and you have to be happy now <laughs> at eight o'clock in the morning, obviously that's not gonna, gonna work. Yeah, okay. That's, it was more a metaphor. And what I mean is the following, following in, uh, from, from the perspective of German systems theory, there's this one idea that every subsystem means that you can be in every subsystem another person. And when you go into your uh, uh, organization in the morning, when you go into your company, you open the door, then you leave parts of your private life behind. And the uh, criticism from uh, German systems theory to models like you are presenting here um, is that people tend to exploit themselves even further when they are connecting deeply with the company's purpose. Mm -hmm. So um, how do you deal with, with this? What, what is your answer to this uh, German critic? Yeah, yeah that's, that's a very good point. I mean, look at many nonprofit leaders. If you look at those, the circle, they don't focus on the bottom right, the profit, mm -hmm. they focus on the purpose, and many of yes. them are completely dysfunctional. Yes. So it's not about focusing on one or the other, but to balance the balance the circle. Okay. So if I uh, focus on the profit and and or on the on the purpose even, and my self expression is driven by fear, if I mm. can recognize that the, the quadrant is going to be left empty, mm. I'm not going to be fulfilled. I'm not going to be in balance. I'm not going to be. I'm not going to be happy. Okay. So I uh, when... ask, can I just ask the audience here? How many of you would prefer to? have a fluid uh, fluidity between your private life and the job, hands up. And how many of you would like to keep it totally separate? How many would like to have a fluidity? How many would like to have it separate? I think it depends on some aspect. Yes, I agree. Yeah. yeah it, Just it, a short note, we have about seven minutes to go. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, we're, we're in a new world and Luyan and you've, we've talked about that it's a complex world where we have no idea what's going to happen. If you were running a company 20 years ago, you could, you could do scenario planning. If this happens, then you'll do that. If this happens, if you'll do that. Now it's like rising, rolling dice without them even having numbers on it. Mm. We do not know what's coming around the corner. So scenario planning is impossible. 
So the most of us are freaking out. Look at COVID. We are freaking out because we don't know what to believe anymore. Um, my conviction is that in this time of complexity and change and uncertainty and evolutionary growth, because this is an evolutionary growth that we are in, the most important thing for us is to be our so to keep our sovereignty, yeah, and to be centered in ourselves, to be aligned, to be not listening to other people what they have to say, but to ultimately be so centered in ourselves that we are sovereign with our own choices. Yeah, because okay. otherwise we project our own. Mm -hmm. uh, expectations, thoughts, conditions mm -hmm. on the people around us, whether it's our children or our boss or the people down the street that we honk at. Mm -hmm. So by everything I understood from your approaches, Peter and Gitta, uh, you have the same goal, you, you have the same direction, but a different way to go there. Um, it's also Gitta's purpose to, go, um, to reach more consciousness, but uh, in a completely different way. Maybe you want to um, make some words on this, Gitta. Um, and I, I already did in context of uh, the answers I gave that we have to take into account social, uh, sociological perspectives and not only uh, psychological perspectives. I completely agree with uh, what uh, you are saying here, Peter. I'm only asking question, questions because what we are doing now is new and we do not know how this uh, whole thing will work out in the end and what consequences are coming with it. And that, that is why I um, ask the, the uh, um, questions that's in the hard questions sometimes, especially when it comes to psychological um, uh, approaches. What I do love is your um, idea on balancing. I totally agree. And um, since we are working here in a, a non-profit organization, I know how fast it can happen that people exploit themselves because of the cause. And that is a problem we have to put into, um, uh, into account. We have to think about this. And I think it is really dangerous from that perspective when uh, companies start to talk about purpose, for example, and then put purpose first as a marketing perspective for their, for their own business purposes and the people working there are starting to exploit themselves, working on uh, personality development, etc. Things that should happen in their private life and not in their working life. I, I think there should be boundaries or at least we should talk about the boundaries. That is something I find important here. And that is why I ask these questions uh, and uh, press the sociological point because um, when we only go over uh, through the psychological perspective, we do not know how the environment in the end will react and what harm there will be done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, I mean, I see purpose as it's just like money or the atomic bomb <laughs> or nuclear <laughs> fusion. Or, mm -hmm. There is an enormous potential of energy in there. Yeah. in our purpose but it really depends how we use it. Unfortunately, in many organizations, it's just purpose washing. Yes. Yes, yeah. and you have you have no control what the people are doing with it. That is the, the real problem. The question, so that's why, I, don't wanna, yeah. I don't want to put it on the organizations because mm -hmm. ultimately we as individuals, and this goes to the question, what is the deeper root? Um, I think Louis and you said we're taking a pill and then hoping things will get better. What is the deeper root for our behaviors that hold us back? Yeah. Which is fear. I think I see one here um, that there's not enough, which is a, an old system that we've been governed by, uh, which we all, each individual one of us has to become accountable for. Yeah. So if we show up in an organization and we work ourselves to slave ourselves to death over a purpose, that's our own uh, balance that we need to check in as well. It's our own accountability as well as the organization's. So this is how we increase our consciousness to become aware of those events in our life and those areas of our life where we operate from fear. Um, so that we, as Ken Wilber says, have the growing up part in there. <laughs> so as uh, we start with second round, uh, because my colleagues also uh, closed the room and, and said it, uh, it's going on at um, 1820, I just want to give Axel the, um, the word again and then make a final statement because 1820, there will come new, new people here. Uh, thanks. I, 
I just wanted to say, I mean, I think it's a lot about giving human agency to people in, in their, wherever they are, not over responsibilization so that they burn out, as you were saying, but, but, but of finding constructive, I want, I use the word sustainable with many brackets, <laughs> something that can, that's real, uh, that gives people human agency. And for me, that's, that's, that's part of the equation. And I was just going to add as a, as another food for thought that instead of, um, instead of having this purpose washing risk, um, I, I think that people can generally connect. Not everyone has this philosophical high level goal of how does my everyday thinking, how does my job fix the universe, fix the world, fix humanity. They just have a, they just have a job and, and they're just trying to connect all their lives to that. And, and so I would say, instead of speaking of purpose, I, I just say, you know, how do we as a team and then how does a team of teams, how do we, how do we just create value in what we're doing? How do I, how do I make sense of, how do I, how do I make sense of how I, we as a team, we as a create value in each little chain of what we have and how do I foster agency? And I just mm. wanted to add that because that removes the feeling of alienation and, um, and, and yeah, that's where I come from in that perspective. Yeah. That's a monosukoli perspective, what you just... Uh, what, what is it? A, a monosukoli perspective. I don't know that word. Mo but... It's monosukoli, um, lean. It's a lean perspective. Okay. Can you write that name now? Because you yeah, said it before, monosukoli. I'm, I'm very curious to that. I, I have to learn a new word today, so I, I want to learn that. Oh, we posted it. Okay. It's more you. exact right. than lean. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I want to give Peter and Gitta the opportunity to uh, make a final statement. And of course, you can stay here within the second round as well. <laughs> uh, when you uh, want to uh, go on with the discussion with these both. Peter, maybe you want to start? Um, I, don't, I don't know what comes. I'm, I'm really curious what's on your mind. So my final statement would be a request to all of you guys to write one sentence in the chat box. What's what you're concerned with so that we can maybe continue to address that. What's, Very yeah. good Someone has a really loud. Sorry, it's me. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. For myself. I mean, you can do that. No, no, at least there was something to hear during this last minute. Is there anything to see? No. No? Is the chat working? Ah, okay. So Julian, so you 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 can see it now, no? From I can can see it from Julian, uh, but from That's nobody fun. else. Since Maybe I'm others come in. Hello Barbara. Yeah, at the final the first round, but you're welcome to join. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, all of um, that you, you write in the chat, we can address in, um, in the documentation later on. I think it's the best way to give a proper answer on this. Bye, Dominique. Hi, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank And you. have a lovely evening. So here we are, Peter. You're coming from California, and I'm I'm a true German. <laughs> I mean, maybe I mean that's, uh, I think that's a good a good point because uh, what what happens in our world because we are looking for new avenues. Uh, yeah. If we are all driving down the same road, it's totally easy. But if we are looking really for different avenues, how to tackle the future, 
one person is going to go right, the other person is going to go left, the other person is going to go up, the other person is going to go down, depending on preferences and, and personality types, quite frankly. Mm. So I think the challenge that we have in front of us is, or not a challenge, or the possibility is, can we embrace all those avenues? Because if we don't embrace them, you see what happens in the United States. I mean, people are talking that half of the country is splintering off in, into a new country here. Yeah. Virginia and all those states down there because it's Republican and the other one's a Democrat and it doesn't fit together anymore. So I think going forward, uh, we just need to embrace, literally embrace the other person's opportunity, even if it, if it doesn't gel with us and say, can yes. we sit together and can we learn from each other? Yes, absolutely. And the other person, the right to, to say, go your pathway we need mm. we need everything we need the whole buffet yeah. here in order to solve yes. the challenges of the future I, I totally agree with that to give people space that is mm -hmm. the way mm -hmm. i um, work with people and the way i um, address people i think it's important to do that and there's pl place for every ide ideology as long as people do not exploit each other that is what i'm pressing here when it comes to psychological concepts and yeah, i'm very 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 cautious um, yes. Shall we look at the next point? Or do, Julian, are you satisfied with, with what we are presenting here to you? I am pleased. So, thank yeah? you. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. That was easy. <laughs> <laughs> step by step. Yeah. Shall we address the next question? Yes. Since we cannot all be thinking of the state of the world in every action we do day to day, how do we help each other making just make th sense in our day-to-day -day lives. Peter, will you start? Yeah, there are actually two things that come to mind. Help others make sense is to, to maintain the bigger perspective and to, to remind the other person that in the end, we're okay. Mm. That we might go through some ups and downs and challenges, but on a bigger, even spiritual level, there, there's a bigger picture here. Um, and for ourselves, what we can do, this one thing that I try to do is honestly to leave every conversation better than I've, I entered it, to leave something better, to enter, to bring love into the conversation. Mm -hmm. And if we can try to do that with everyone that we meet, whether it's on the street or our children, things will change. Mm -hmm. This is fascinating. We do come from different uh, we do different approaches with the same intention i go i play the antithesis here that i um, try to uh, motivate um, not to be triggered by whatever someone else is saying or if you are triggered accept your emotions and use your brain uh, mm -hmm. even when you are emotional mm -hmm. um so um, I think for a long time we have tried to uh, create constructive solutions and these led to people who are not constructive any longer because they cannot deal any longer with people who they find non-constructive non or, or even destruct destructive. So there is a, a gap here to be filled through what I call an antithesis. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Mm -hmm. I think in, 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 I agree with you, Gita, on this point because what I realize in the companies that, that we work for at the moment that there is a, a harmony trap. Yeah. That you know uh, we are not used uh, to really, um, yeah, talk to each other and uh, make crucial conversations and. Uh, name the things that uh, that are there and we still have people that you know in the essence of their their uh, work life sort of always have this habit tell me tell me what i should do yeah, yeah? and if i don't have the boundaries and if it's not clear and uh, you haven't thought about this and that they get angry and and feel lost mm -hmm. and because there is not enough safety and because we come from a very hierarchical world yes. and it's so immensely uh, difficult for people to step out of that and really use the space that's there and really go into uh, confrontational uh, talks, but, uh, you know, with the love around it, but it's, uh, uh, you know, it's maybe it's also a cultural thing, but it's 
I think it's really hard. It's really hard work to do. Yes, yeah. it's it's um, it's resilience we need in all systems. And um, I think what Peter is doing is really helpful because then people know at least there's one person in the room staying room staying kind when everybody else uh, <laughs> is getting digging into conflict. And um, I try to be that person by making absolutely stupid jokes. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it, it, is, it is possible to have a conflict with a bit loveliness. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, conflict is. I mean, it's a it's a descent. So you think that I think that you like strawberries. If we talk about strawberries and you like strawberries and I don't, do we need to have a fight over that? When it comes to strawberries, yeah. strawberries probably. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Then we have a fight. Then we have a fight. Yes. <laughs> I think it's interesting. I'm I'm working with a colleague and uh, and she has a framework for that. She says, only if I love you enough, I am willing to get in, to go into conflict with you. Mm. So you know, only if you are important enough to me, uh, I'm willing because conflict does is energetically. Uh, exhausting sometimes and so it's really I need a good reason to do that and mm. so it's always in her mind it's always connected with love yes. and, and that was to me very helpful because it just opened a door mm. but again let's stay careful we are talking about people here who can have the luxury to yeah. li live yes. with conflict many people on this planet do not Yeah, they live in poverty. When we look at Palestine and Israel, for example, the, this sort of conflict is anything else than creative. It is hard, it is life-threatening, and people are uh, fighting, and that is not something really nice. Yeah, so, um, I believe it's really important for us going forward, all of us, to distinguish between crisis and normal situations. Yes. Because if people are in crisis, it requires a different intervention than if we go in work and leadership and we have the opportunity to create something different. Yes. Yeah. And, yes. And another thing that I realized over over the years that we're basically in the business of fear management. Mm. We're fear mm. managers. <laughs> Because ultimately, when people don't speak up, there's not a safe room for them to express themselves. They're afraid or whatever. And so... Um, How we can change situations, I believe, is to create a space where people can feel safe enough to show up differently yes. and express themselves. Yeah. Oh, and if the oh. quality of the space is not there, then then the company will suffer as a consequence of that because mm. things will be held under the table and teamwork will suffer, etc. How do you all feel about uh, politics in this context, for example, uh, concerning universal basic income in order to help people to already be at least a little bit less fearful when it comes to open their mouths because they know when they will lose their jobs, they are safe and they are not uh, uh, bounded by something like health fear or even worse, There is in, in you are in Romania, uh, Julian, right? Yeah. yeah. Yes, and you have nothing like heart sphere, right? Like what? Heart sphere, like or our heart sphere welfare system. You have nothing like that, right? No, no, no. no. So um, people, how do they? Yeah, they they have to live with fear. Uh, they live with fear because there's nothing they can do about it. When they do something wrong, they lose their jobs. Um. Yeah, I think there is a fear. So the fear of not having um, enough money to pay a rent or to pay mm -hmm. um, to have uh, a decent meal the next day. Mm -hmm. But um, most people usually fear they won't have comfort. And uh, comfort, even if it is a general, they don't like being uh, stressed up, pushed up uh, from behind. So mm -hmm. they like to sit I know, uh, having a nice meal, watching Netflix, and they like to remain on that basis. And when something came from the environment and uh, disrupts a little, I, I think that that is uh, a, a symptom of, of fear for them, not um, uh, necessarily, uh, let's say, um, a complicated uh, um, Personal uh, corruption. 
Mm. Did did Corona uh, change uh, the psych the, the, the statistical uh, psychological um, balance in your uh, home country? Because in in uh, um, wealthy countries in Europe, we see a shift. Is it the same in Romania? Actually, yes, it is weird. Actually, what is happening? Mm -hmm. And uh, as I said, the richer people really get got a little more richer these days. And um, people who really had a few bucks, they have nothing left because they didn't have enough um, uh, education to learn the, let's say, about the internet, to use it as a tool to sell more or uh, an investment. Staying home, you do not... Uh, You don't make money staying home. So uh, this is uh, a part where um, jobs, most of the jobs, uh, they uh, they went online. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, this is uh, as it happens most of the countries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we were speaking about transforming economy, planetary flourishing here. So when we talk about survival which we're talking about here right because a lot of people are between the cracks it's about oh my god how am i going to pay my next meal how am i going to pay rent there's no care about the environment it's how am i going to pay my next rent and rightly so because it's about survival right and clearly clearly if that and a lot of our population maybe 80% of the population maybe 90 95% of our population is in that place globally yes Uh, and so if we talk about human flourishing and planetary flourishing, that's that's an obstacle which we need to address uh, to get people from out of survival mode into into sustain mode first before we can go them into flourishing mode. So there is a huge endeavor in front of us. Mm. Yeah, I think there's a gap and I think this gap has to be discussed also in business. I think that, that leaders and business leaders have to address this topic among each other, to talk to, talk to each other about this and what they can do to change the situation and um, work with political leaders and us speak up. I think we first need a, a competent democracy where not all people uh, participate in it. Yeah. Yeah. Not everyone will pers uh, participate in a competent democracy. There will be no equal participation, by, but rather equal equal opportunities. But not all should be participate. So in this in this way, uh, competent people will give, uh, let's say, laws. They will be strictly for uh, their mind domains. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've you've addressed a huge topic, Julian, about about comfort. Mm. Because we're 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 programmed to want comfort, <laughs> most of us. <laughs> There's one question. I'll get it out anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Remaining in the chat, uh, which came from Ulrike, um, and she wrote, "There are in initiatives that focus on opportunities, but I don't see they are that successful. So, do they only work in smaller groups?" group of people mm -hmm. what do you think about that i have to think if i understand the question <clears throat> yeah i um maybe i tried uh, yeah what what i understand is uh that she says uh, all the steps uh, which are taken until now um aren't the solution so uh, the question is Do the steps which were already taken already uh, only work in smaller groups and not in societies or bigger companies? That's how I understand this question. I would I would disagree. I would I actually see big opportunities can spread. If you look at Silicon Valley, it's opportunity based. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's a whole region that where people seek out the opportunity. They have the courage to quit their job to join that new startup company that wants to make a difference. It's very purpose oriented. All the companies are jumping on. Let's create a better work environment because otherwise, they quite frankly don't get the talent that they need. So there's a mm -hmm. fear behind that as well. 
So I think, um, again, we change with either through pain or through pleasure and pleasure is the opportunity that we seek. Uh, and I don't think if we go on back to Petra, if we don't have that clear North Star, the narrative that's strong enough where we can say, wow, this is worth getting up for in the morning, then we go back into comfort and, and avoiding, avoiding pain. Mm. Um, I personally believe that, again, if we don't address our fears of not enough, what we call the model of dominant subservience that governs our thinking um, on the lower level is the, the victim mentality, the anger mentality that we have. If we don't get a hold of that, nothing will change because we will always fall back into this old paradigm of going operating from fear. So again, that's why I was saying in the beginning, we need, to, we need a top-down approach where we speak about opportunity, change the narrative, but we all need to do our own homework and, and make this trauma-based conversation that we're starting to have a little bit more popular, maybe. <laughs> yeah. mm. um, I think the whole um, idea of capitalism is the idea of grabbing opportunities and making something out of it, which not has uh, uh, to be uh, something uh, evil or bad, but uh, it is um, capitalism is opportunity driven. And we see the same thing now in uh, when it comes to question of climate change, where people are taking the opportunity to waiting for the northern ice to melt so there can be new lines for uh, transport be open through sea. Yeah, um, it's it's as everything as we discussed it here, it's uh, also a two-edged sword. Uh, which opportunities do I wish to grasp? Uh, and what ethical questions are uh, um, uh, com combined with the, uh, uh, with the particular opportunity that is opening up here? Uh, today, I hear many people saying, don't call it a, a problem, call it a challenge and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, I, th I think there's a problem also with that. It's on one side, it's a good thing to have the resilience to see, okay, the tiger is approaching me. Now I can learn how to run a little bit faster than uh, I did yesterday. <laughs> but um, um, on the other hand, sometimes there is a problem and you have to deal with problems. And that's the same with fear. I, I do fear a lot of fear, a lot of things. And I find found often my fears very, very helpful and um, actually a very factual. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I find it a little, a little bit hard not to think about myself as a victim, for example, when I think about of, of my uh, per, my role as a woman in business society, where I often see that I have uh, less opportunities as uh, um, male as, as men have. You know, when it comes to the way how I speak, I have to be very kind, and if I do not do that, people think I'm arrogant or something mm. like that, which I'm not. You know? <laughs> but um, so it's it's all these this stuff we are talking about here. I think we have to do this in a differentiated way, and see where it works and see where it not works. Yeah, Peter, as you say, um, fear is a problem. I I come. I have lived many, many years in crisis. I know a lot about this. And it's almost 30 years where we have to, uh, where we were alone and have to deal with problems most people in Germany never do not know about. And what I learned there is that when I uh, feel fear, it is, uh, I often were really, really right to have this feeling. And this is another thing as when you have a job and you go into to your uh, work with your team and you have a, a leader that is uh, trying to be the boss. So you, you are fearful and then you uh, do not bring yourself in and you do not find it very attractive to go there. That's, that's a different thing. So we always have this, you call it crisis or con uh, what was the other thing? Crisis and? Opportunity or uh, challenge. Cha yeah, okay, yeah. Well, these are two two different things that I think we should keep in mind that uh, um, our feelings sometimes are right. Mm. Now we get into a really juicy conversation, guys. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's what the Lanaka conference is all about. Um, <laughs> and I would say challenging feelings uh, are always real. Pardon? That's the next thing. Um, 
what I would add, uh, feelings are always real. Yes. Uh, not depending on which level of uh, existential danger we are talking about. So if someone has, has the fear of losing his job or, or, or earning $10,000 less, it's a real fear, yeah? uh, even if it's, so I guess in this moment for, for this person, it's, it's real. So that's, it's also problematic. Yeah. Do you guys know the work of the IPEC coaching group? No. They, they have the system of energy leadership, which I really, really like. I can, I can really encourage you to look at it, IPEC, IPEC, uh, where they look at the human, how, on which level we behave as humans, victim, anger, responsibility, accountability, and then going out to more spiritual levels. Uh, and we often, we all bounce between all these levels, but there are certain levels that we clink into usually. Um, so I'm, I was just asking myself, is there a reason, and maybe you can do that with me, is find a situation where we felt shit, I mean, really crap, and, and where we felt as a victim. Yeah or really angry about something because we drop down into these deep levels. And the question behind that is the situation is real. The fear is real. The anger is real because it's sitting right there in our body. And at the same time, do, can we do anything not to operate from that? Yeah. You know, not to enter into the world from that. So what is necessary in order to get out of that state? Uh, maybe we need to sit in it for a while, accept it for a while, but how can we slip back into the more empowered states? And I think that's an exercise which is super important for us to be to, to become accountable for when we're in, in anger, victim, pointing fingers mode. And maybe not to engage as powerfully in the world when we're in that stage. <laughs> Do well, our work. <laughs> well, sometimes we have to uh, put fingers Sometimes we have to say this is wrong. You should not do this, especially when it comes to oppression and uh, suppressive systems. Mm -hmm. So sometimes fear and anger are very helpful emotions, uh, especially in political contexts. Yeah, I'm very careful with right and wrong. Mm -hmm. Because in my eyes, right and wrong is only valid in accordance to a certain value system. Yeah, right. context. Mm, okay. So you replace uh, with works uh, or doesn't work. It's the same. Uh, yeah. Give it us. <laughs> yeah. If we want, if we choose to live in a society where we support each other, where we flourish as human beings, it's just unacceptable that somebody beats the other person or yes, beats them or something. Yes. To me, it is uh, fascinating to see the difference between direct and indirect oppression. And I um, digged into um, all big ideologies we uh, have today, all religions. I lived them for some months and um, I really digged into rhetoric and the idea of soft values now popping up everywhere in economy. And I see that there is a risk of suppression coming from there, too. Yeah, when you have, um, Barbara uh, addressed it earlier on, uh, harmony systems that uh, cannot deal with conflict, but even more, they cannot deal with critical people. Yeah, so what you are saying here, Peter, consequently means that you are also opening up this, uh, the room for conflict and for, for even for pointing fingers, right, if this is necessary to do. Yeah. yeah. So Funny is that most you... conflicts come from um, giving advices. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's something beneficial that brings a little terror in the ground. Yeah. <laughs> we have a few minutes, six minutes of, uh, left until the end of this panel of the conference. Um, thank you very much. I um, I would like to hear something. Did you gain perspectives after that? Um, or do you have an idea what to do next? A little baby step for a better world, maybe for a better economic system. I came in back a little late. Yeah. Um, yeah but what the question, what popped up? Uh, hearing the, this discussions 
for me was this uh, you have a smoker and he can't quit so always this <laughs> this thing is it is this a structural problem is this a psychic problem why doesn't he quit he knows that it's bad for him yeah i i know people they have a heart attack had a heart attack and they don't quit smoking <laughs> probably say no it's not good for them but yeah. they don't quit and that's always the question yeah how do you make them quit i think every single person on this planet has the right to uh, to die uh, his or her own way and to suffer their own way so i would not even try to make <laughs> make him or her quit but the discussion i guess that the discussion i would i would uh, i would uh, uh, when i'm interested in this person i would discuss it but i would not try to uh, mm -hmm. uh, change Mm -hmm. But the problems the we have in the world are that the people, the leaders mm -hmm. in, in the powerful positions uh, have to change. They have to quit. And maybe it's an assumption that they want to change and don't do it. Maybe it's not an assumption because they like it like it is. Because everything, I guess, every, every big leader in the world knows that we're driving the planet uh, against the war yeah mm. why don't they quit mm. well that's exactly it's exactly the point we we're addicted yeah we're fully addicted and and i think you're you got a point there because we need to treat it as an addiction now the the great leaders out there of the top leaders they know exactly what needs to happen right yeah. but as you say there there's no change that we need to see mm -hmm. And it's because of addiction to certain things, yes. Mm, I think the, the um, way to change is to work with those who are already on the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. then, then there's, uh, then you have the pressing point of, you bring mass, be mass behind, not mass, <laughs> mass. <laughs> <laughs> uh, or even mathematics, right? Yeah. <laughs> you bring <laughs> math behind your idea, and when you do that, other people will follow. So let them smoke. Right. <laughs> yeah, connect the non smokers. <laughs> yeah. But it's not the exactly. same. Yeah. If I smoke, yeah. I don't necessarily have impact on others. That's the same thing like in the pandemic. Yeah. Uh, if I work in it or don't, uh, it's, it's a discussion. It's not the same if I smoke uh, or if I uh, um, infect other people because yeah. not knowing that I'm infectious, for example. Mm. Right. Yeah, it's, it's a great point. I mean, uh, if you look at the statistics, 80% of the younger generation wants to work with purpose. So they're, they're just done. There's a new system that's coming into the business world. When we work with larger organizations, uh, like at BMW, we were oftentimes work on the middle management level because the top is not willing to change. They've got there with their old systems and they're very happy where they are. And to change at that age with that success is very challenging. Um, so if we go on the middle level with the support from the top, then we create what you say, these, these islands, um, and they eventually connect and create create coherence. We need and many systems. Crossed, <laughs> the system can hopefully tip eventually. <laughs> Early on. Uh, yeah, we need many many systems that we, uh, or let's say, we need an approach. So on the problems with the system with the system thinking. Mm -hmm. Because there's a cube. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that, that's the form rate approach to uh, deliver a platform where everybody can learn the mm. fundamental concepts of systems theory mm. in, a easy, in an easy way and integrate it into communication to navigate this new era and these new complexities we have to deal with. And there's, there's another um, uh, advantage we have here, Peter um, and, and Markus, uh, we, can, we can connect on a global level today. That was not pos possible 50 years ago. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's yeah. make a start with these conferences and stay tuned, um, go on working to, to connect over the regions, over the countries um, to build this social sculpture around here. 
it's, it, it's just the uh, initial start here and we really want to go on working together on this topics and on, on the topics of all the other panels. Yeah. Thank you for uh, dedicating your life's energy to this. Peter, you have to stand have to stand up this early on a Sunday morning. <laughs> Thank you so this is, much. This is my church for me. <laughs> is, yeah, okay. <laughs> That's my life. So I'm going to go for a beach walk with my wife now. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Also fine. <laughs> well, well, there's no to sleep. Sunday before you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> for joining yeah. this session, uh, for joining this panel. It was really lovely to work with you. Yes, it was. was a wonderful evening. Yeah. Thank, Thank you very much. Lot. Yeah. Thanks so much. Take good Thank care, you. everybody. Bye. 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 See you. See you.